a simple example is basically through uh, this pandemic. There was so many research about the, the health benefits of, of using um, uh, nicotine uh, plaster. Is it called plaster in English? Yeah. yeah uh, for Corona. And when, as a scientist, I immediately look up where it was published, and you know, and who, and then you figure out it was basically financed by a tobacco industry company, or like uh, another study about wine and Corona. And similar studies were like also uh, in the newspaper about cancer that I don't know what will help to reduce cancer in wine or like stuff like that, which is not true. But as I said, they are financed by wineries or like some people who are benefiting from business. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Hala, thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you uh, on The No Show. And um, I'm really pleased to uh, say that you're the first academic from Iraqi origins uh, to join me on the No Show, so I'm really excited about that too. Thanks for having me. Um, so let us start off with um, your your essentially journey through academia before you got to research in, you know, um, environmental toxicology and that sort of stuff. What what was what what were your drivers in academia? What interest what what interest did you have? What sort of piqued your your curiosity? Um, I was I think my curiosity started quite early, like even before academia. So um, my mom just reminded me, like uh, like uh, a couple of years ago, that uh, when I was six or seven years old, she asked me what kind of present I want, and uh, my siblings they chose like according to the age, like a car or like something yeah. more like, uh, and I asked for a microscope. So I think my, my, my passion about science or uh, this stuff started really early. And uh, yeah, I, 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 it was a good reminder that how I was cutting the onions to see the cell of the onion underneath the microscope. It was a battery one, but it was really exciting for me. So I would say science was a big factor in my life really early. And I would say also my parents encouraged that. Like they, they didn't think it was odd that I wanted to buy books with the age of eight or nine about the human body anatomy. So I was always curious about this part, but I knew I didn't want to be a, become a medical doctor. I was more interested to understand the mechanism and everything underneath all these layers. So that, that's all, yeah. So you started off as a nerd. You started off very, very young as, as a geek. Yes. <laughs> Like so, yes. No, and so um, it's interesting that you you didn't take the typical path of wanting to be a doctor, um, and obviously you said because you like to sort of understand the mechanisms. Um, do you feel like having gone down the route that that you've gone down, you you in, you you enjoy um, you still enjoy sort of looking at the mechanisms? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, through this journey, I mean, um, I grew up in Vienna and Austria, so I met through this um, journey many interesting people, uh, quite inspirational, and what they achieved in, in preventing cancer. It was um, really a goal, like what I want also to achieve in life. Um, I think it's uh, like science is really rewarding. It's it's, um, especially in the field of cancer research. So I wouldn't say that I regretted my choice. No, I would say it was the best choice because first of all, I can't see blood. 
makes me a terrible doctor, I guess. And second of all, it's really, it's different. I mean, um, because we have the cancer patient on one at one end, but we see the cell and what uh, caused this pain to this uh, human. So I think it's, we are on the other side of the spectrum, which is really important, I think. In your summary, before before we um, recorded the podcast, um, we we discussed some of your earlier some some of your research, um, and I must say with so much confidence that you are the first person to explain cancer to me that actually made it sound so incredibly simple, um, and I think that's that, that's amazing because you know everybody. I think by this point in time, everybody listening or everybody, um, you know, watching the show has been touched by cancer, whether it's directly or whether it's through yeah. friends or, or, or colleagues, et cetera. Um, so why cancer? What, what sort of led you to go down the route of un wanting to understand cancer and cure cancer? Um, as you said, everyone got touched by someone, uh, Year who died by cancer or who who survived cancer. So um, I had many friends, unfortunately, who who got cancer, who didn't survive. Some of them survived. So for me, it was um, something like 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 an issue, and we need to just tackle it and see why it's happening. I think, uh, um, yeah. I think at the age of 17 or 18, for me, it was more like, that's a problem, let's try to solve it. And of course, through the, like in the last 15 years, more than 15 years, in my career, I noticed it's a way bigger problem. And there are so many factors involved in cancer. So yeah, but I would say, yeah, it's basically uh, through um, experience. And for audience for some of our audience who aren't familiar with how cancer works could you just um, repeat that a simple explanation or simplified explanation of how cancer works sure so basically um, as I mentioned earlier our DNA the human genome comprises of a string of molecules known as nucleotides and I think um, the audience know that the DNA uh, are represented in the letters A, C, G and T Sometimes changes happen in the spelling of our DNA, and the A, for example, can become a G. These changes, known as uh, mutation, can be caused by a number of factors, and some of them being processes occurring within cells, so called endogenous processes, for example, stress is one of them, and some of them due to external factors such as toxic substances in the air we breathe or the food we eat, so called exogenous factors. And how the cells become cancerous? As cell divide, they make copies of their DNA. So any spelling mistakes on those four letters, A, C, G, and T, will be reproduced. Over time, the number of errors is accumulating, leading to uncontrolled cell growth, or even can cause drug resistance. So basically, you can see it as a microevolution process where the cancer cells trying to get some advantage over the normal cell lines in the human body. And Obviously, with this uncontrolled growth, what happens? So, uh, uncontrolled, uh, it's basically the cell, the cancerous cell lines start to divide uncontrolled and becomes more and more and bigger. And of course, um, um, usually when there is a, a, like a mistake in this uh, DNA, in one of the, the try, normally the cells try to repair it. But if the mistake happens in a place where the cells won't notice it, or even the repair mechanism is damaged, so this damage will be given passing over to the daughter cells. And of course, they can happen either that, for example, it will avoid apoptosis, so they will just grow, become bigger, become more. And then the last step is the cancer cells will get detached from the tissue and then start to uh, circulate in the human body, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's called metastasis. And so you've you obviously looked at the, a, a variety of um, factors that contribute to these cells, um, you know, mutating or these mutations happening. Um, and you mentioned 
uh, diet was one. Um, you mentioned substances is one. What were the what have been the the factors that you've looked at in, in particular? Um, so basically, um, there have been, as I said, like many reviews already uh, in this field where they suggested that like uh, diet and smoking are the two major uh, risk factors for cancer. And uh, one of the diet, uh, diet factors is beta pyrin, which you find not only found in grilled meat, but you will find also in tobacco smoke. So what we did is basically we treated a mini organ, which we grow in the lab, they're called organoids. And we treated them with the beta A pyrin. And then uh, we did the whole genome sequencing. And we saw that uh, this mutational signature, which we got basically in the organoids, are uh, matching the ones we found in human tumor. And so you, you begin to sort of make, uh, you know, pat you recognize patterns. And once you recognize these patterns, um, what are you able to do? So, I mean, what we are uh, uh, right now doing is creating an expanded library of mutation signatures for all the dietary carcinogens. Because, as I said, I mean, we did one for beta A primer, but another one for aerosolic acid, but there are plenty of them. And such information will, in the future, hopefully allow doctors to identify more factors responsible for causing cancer. And probably also it would help us to reduce people's exposure to those like um, uh, mutagens or carcinogens. And so with the nature of, of cancer and, and, and similar diseases and how they work, um, it's an incredibly large and collaborative effort where, you know, every, different people are working on different ends. And so what you guys are doing is essentially creating this database or this library of um, is it the, the, the mutations, if I understand right? Yes, exactly. And it's in collaboration with uh, Sanger Institute uh, in Cambridge. And I mean, uh, we have many partners. So basically, we have also the Institute of uh, Research on Cancer, IAC, uh, International Agency on Research on Cancer in France, and also Sanger, who are helping us. And we have teams who are collecting, basically, uh, tumor samples from all five continents. And they are doing all this uh, sequencing. So from their end, they are trying to collect as much as possible tumor uh, tumor samples and sequences. And what we are doing from our end is basically we take the agents, treat the organized with them, and also get the signatures. And we are trying to match to understand what uh, what uh, I mean why this cancer I mean why um, if this human was exposed to a certain agent which at the end caused the cancer. Mm -hmm. And for future, we are aiming to basically um, um, maybe we will be able to limit the exposure to the certain mutagens or like our compounds. Are there sort of any particular types of exposures that um, you guys are looking at more? Um, I mean, we started with um, the things which are really like. I mean, we did the allosteric acid, uh, which is basically uh, found, uh, which causes uh, kidney cancer and other type of cancer, but also it's found uh, the human are exposed to it to contaminated meat and herbal remedies. And um, tobacco smoke is like basically, since it's a big player in, the, uh, in cancer, so sometimes uh, people think it's like one thing, it has more than 60 years, different types of mutagens. So we are trying to go through them to see which one at the end caused uh, the cancer. And other dietary factors, I mean, there are plenty. I, I don't know where to start. <laughs> the I, list is around 70. I, I'm, I'm, I'm only thinking because, you know, so, some countries and um, obviously the different geographic locations, people would be um, exposed to completely different things. Um, and you know like for example where we both originate from um it's a country iraq has been a country that's been exposed to all sorts of wars and chemical uh, weapons and that sort of stuff and so how much interest um do you feel like then this is just an opinion um how much interest do you feel um there is within cancer research in looking at places like that 
looking at places where that that have had in like all these different sort of horrible exposures is there do you do you feel like science has given it enough attention in looking at sort of cancer over there um i agree with you i mean to be honest uh, that's what's also one of my the reasons why i want to study cancer research um but i feel like um the list which we are working on is basically the known or confirmed uh, um, chemicals which cause which are linked to cause uh, cancer but the ones used in weapons that's unfortunately something um, like on a different level so I mean what we are trying is is collecting samples from people from different continents but I don't really think that people in war zones got the right attention um, yeah so I think that still there's a, a gap at least there and maybe yeah in the future it should be a goal it's my goal at least yeah, and I think it's I think it's it's a very worthy goal, whether it's Iraq or any other country that's you know suffered these sorts of um, these sorts of situations or, or experiences. Um, but with that said, um, how hopeful are you that um, we are making genuine breakthroughs in cancer, or are we still a long, long way away? Um, that's a good. Uh, question. The problem with cancer is um, there is like there are people or in groups who are working on therapy to, to find the best treatment for cancer patients. And but in my opinion, is it's still prevention is key. And um, unfortunately, uh, some bad choices or habits can uh, trigger cancer, can increase the risk of getting cancer. And so it's one part from our side, we can tell people what, are, uh, what those factors are. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's up to the population or up to the people at the end, if they want to quit smoking or reduce the amount of alcohol or like um, uh, if they decide to stop having real meat. I think it's then up to the people. But of course, like what the government can do is um, reduce uh, um, factors which are in the environment basically for what people breathe but sometimes it's also up to the people and to make the right choice basically do you think then in that case do you think um, it's possible to change people's behaviors um, given that there's so many forces competing so for example you have forces of like large industries that benefit from people making decisions that might not be very healthy. Um, do you think it's possible to educate people and move them away? I mean, that's basically what we are uh, hoping with this project. Uh, when we build the like the, the strong link because between, uh, for example, smoking and uh, like uh, lung cancer or the other type of cancer which might be caused by smoking, I hope then this will help to to open the eyes of the people but um yeah i know the industry is quite strong behind it because it's like a, ben a beneficial be uh, like business but yeah so in in the course of your research career so far um has there been any moment that sort of has been shocking to you or has been eye-opening something that stands out for you um i think through the time um, when you start uh, in science you start to understand and distinguish between good papers and bad papers and what you notice is that like work which has been uh, like uh, financed or like supported financially from from companies they are the ones who get to the public and uh, my colleague and I, we are really uh, engaged in public engagement We try to talk about our research, but then people are telling us we read this and that and we don't know what to trust or whom to trust. And the problem is I get it because like the kind of research what we are doing is not really reaching the people the, and 
So I think such a podcast is really helpful because then it will um, avoid this misleading information. And I think um, a simple example is basically through uh, this pandemic. There were so many research about the, the health benefits of, you, of using um, uh, nicotine uh, plaster. Is it called plaster in English? Yeah. yeah uh, for Corona. And when, as a scientist, I immediately look up where it was published, and you know, and who, and then you figure out it was basically financed by a tobacco industry company, or like uh, another study about wine and Corona, and similar studies were like also um, in the newspaper about cancer that I don't know what will help to reduce cancer if you drink wine or like stuff like that, which is not true. But as I said, they are financed by wineries or like some people who are benefiting who are business and they are not even published in serious um, um, journals which is a problem because they are published but they are not really a serious uh, science so that's, that's this, not a shock. this is a major problem because um why i mean for, for, for an outsider from sort of the, the science the sciences how do people get away with this stuff? How, how are there no checks and balances that stop people producing, or you know, coming up with publications and conclusions that are essentially false? Um, I mean, the journals are like where such kind of science is published is not a serious journal from the beginning. So, and everyone is able to uh, to open a journal. It's not like, and you have to pay them, but publish this kind of studies so it's more um i don't know how to phrase it in a polite way but it's yeah, money makers yeah, yeah so it's, it's more more of like a um like a, a public relations campaign exactly exactly so that was for me a shocking moment because then uh, when i see something in the news or even when you get uh, phone calls from family or friends who are not scientists or they are like we read or we hear this in the news or something and I'm like it's not really sometimes the title is misleading because they interpreted the paper or the work in the wrong way and uh, on the other hand uh, it's like not a really a serious um, study. It's also quite problematic now that I mean I'm sure you've experienced this um, especially during the, during the coronavirus pandemic um that you know like parents or relatives or friends you know receive all these whatsapp messages and that give you all these treatments and cures and you know like um this sort of stuff for coronavirus or gives you reasonings about where coronavirus has come from and so how much do you think or or rather do you think that there needs to be um, a way to get through to these um, people, getting the right voices across to them. Because, I mean, as far as I see it, academics' voices are left to academia. And just, exactly. uh, yeah. and, and social media's voices are, are left to the influencers. And so an influencer who has no background in science at all um, can say something that can reach half a million people like that. And you know, like a scientist who works day and night on, on a particular area of research, publishes a paper and, you know, gets downloaded 14 times. So is it, how much do you think we need to change the format so that pe like everybody can listen and see? Um, I think the first step uh, would be that scientists leave their bubbles because scientists uh, communicate their research, uh, research and results only with scientists. And even when we publish studies, which are really relevant, like for example, I, in, I, I used to work in Vienna in the Institute of Cancer Research, and I had a colleague who worked in the field of nutrition and the relation to cancer, uh, Dr. Franziska Berg. And I mean, her results are key findings and they are so relevant for, for the human. But as I said, we published it in a journal, which is for the scientific community as well, although the findings are really relevant. And what she did at the end was a calendar with recipes, where she shared like some of the her findings in the recipes, and they are like the health benefits. So I feel like maybe um, that we leave this bubble, start 
talking in podcast, maybe more in radio or TV, just to reach a bigger audience. And I think what I really liked what you said earlier in, the, in our like interview is like basically to keep it simple, like not to use uh, science uh, words and phrases, just keep it simple because at the end we want to reach the people. We are not doing the science, but we are doing just for ourselves. I think this is a problem that look, I I experienced and uh, loads of my friends and um, colleagues and people in the, in the industry experienced as well, or students, graduates, you know, like you, you reach a paper, um, you, you might be doing a dissertation or you might be just doing some kind of research and you have to do a literature review and then you end up on this paper and it's written in the, the most complex language you can find. I mean, even linguists who have studied at Cambridge would struggle to understand what the person is trying to communicate. And so I think, do you, I mean, do you agree that, that there needs to be not just sort of more exposure through different formats, but do you think academics get enough training in, in how to communicate their papers? Um, I think for the, uh, in the case of papers, it's yeah, it's a bit tricky because we have certain guidelines from from the journal itself. So I would say it's something inherited. So basically, that's how the previous people uh, did it, and that's how we keep doing it. Um, and maybe to to make it more simple, it is different because in the paper you try to explain the methods we use in a scientific way in, a, in a, an accurate way and I feel like it's basically like any instruction which you read for a machine like when you buy a new washing machine it's not really simple like sometimes it's also a bit tricky so I think it's because you, when you publish uh, in a scientific journal you know it's like for a specific people who are working in the same field so they are familiar with all these words which are used in this paper but if you want to, to read a paper in a field which is not really related to you or your studies, it, it, it must be really tricky. Mm. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about your sort of interests for the future. What kind of work do you want to sort of build on from here besides, you know, fin finishing off this library? Um, what, what other work, what other areas of inter uh, interest do you have? Um, my other interest is basically teaching. So I, what I figured out uh, doing my work at King's College London is that I really en enjoy teaching the students. So I mean, I hope that I can still do research, but also become a lecturer to teach students. And um, I don't know, sometimes it's interesting when you see a student starting and he's not that passionate about science, but then he gets somehow the fire which you have because you talk with so much passion and so much like you show him how relevant it is what you are uh, right now studying or learning and it's nice to see the change and this aha moment where like okay now I see the bigger picture and that's something I really enjoy and at the beginning I, you know when you surround yourself with professors you feel like I don't know so much like mm -hmm. my knowledge is quite limited but then when you are like giving this knowledge to students, you figure out, no, you know a lot actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, and, and I think it's this journey that you're, you're sort of transitioning from what the student to the professor and you're, you're going through that journey, you get to appreciate it a lot more. Um, so with regards to um, sort of uh, research wise, do you have any, um, how, what are you going to build on from what you're doing now? So basically, uh, the research that we are doing, I mean, um, we are using right now Organoids, which is a 3D cell culture model. But of course, there is like a lot of room of improvement to optimize all these models which, where we are treating our test compounds. And to create this extended library, it will take a lot of time uh, to build all the links uh, and match them with the human tumors. So the main goal is at the end really to be able to, to tell people, yes, you got cancer, but it was linked to this or that. Maybe it, I think it will really help people to know why this is why this happened. 
because I, I mean, for personal experience, uh, I know people when they got lung cancer, they were confused because they are non-smoker. Mm. And then it was not really satisfying to say it was bad luck. So with this, we might help to tell them what is exactly the thing, what causes it, what triggers it. And maybe also to, to reduce the amount of exposure. I mean, um, there have been events where the governments are interested to know about our research just to, to protect the people from cancer. Mm -hmm. um, where can people find you online? Online? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a good question. I mean, on the King's College homepage. Um, I mean, my Instagram is quite private, so please don't follow me on Instagram, people. <laughs> But yeah, LinkedIn as well. Do you, so, not, do you have a, a Twitter or anything like that? No, unfortunately not. What we do have is the homepage for the Grand Challenge UK project. Okay. So where we keep, it, there's also a blog about all the findings, what, what, what's going on in the project. And it's a, it's a nice format so people can have a look and know or what the updates are on this project. So I'll, I'll link those um, onto the episode so people can get direct access to it. Um, just finally, what word of advice would you give to someone um, that's just starting out in this field? Um, if you really like this field, if you are really passionate about it, be patient. Don't give up uh, too early. I know academia is quite challenging, but it's rewarding. And... Um, yeah, I think um, maybe sometimes sitting in the lab, working uh, behind the microscope, you don't know why you're doing this. But at the end, when you see the bigger picture, it makes sense and you see the connection and then you start to build the connection. And it's really rewarding. So be patient and be stubborn sometimes. Excellent. Uh, that's excellent advice. Um, Hala, thank you so much for, for your time. I really appreciate it. And, um, it's actually been uh, very insightful for me personally, and I'm sure the audience um, appreciate it too. Um, just a quick reminder to the audience, if you're um, tuning in and listening to the show, um, you can support the show by visiting our Patreon, uh, that's patreon.com forward slash the no show, and you can uh, become a member there and just help us keep the show alive so we can bring more um, fascinating people like Carla to the show who are doing not only work that is interesting but it's actually fundamentally important to society and it enriches society so um do help us keep the show alive um once again hala thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it thank you so much for having me and thanks for this nice podcast i'm a big fan of it thank you thank you so much thank you for watching this video please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on for those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.